Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today, we're going to talk about programming with Solidity and Ethereum. So I'm going to look at some of the uh, capabilities of Ethereum. Um, these slides and this video are available under a Creative Commons license. And the slide deck includes content from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas and Gavin. So I'd like to thank them for making their content available under the Creative Commons license. Also, uh, this presentation is not investment advice or legal advice and mentions of particular blockchain projects are not an endorsement, it's just for educational purposes only. So let's talk about Solidity. So first off, let's talk about, uh, you know, Solidity is a programming language, it's pretty similar to Java and C++, but it's more complicated in those languages in some ways. And it's got a lot of capabilities. So we're gonna take a look at some of those capabilities in this, in this lecture. So first off, let's take a look at data types. So some of the basic data types that Solidity offers, it offers a Boolean data type, um, you know, for true and false values. Um, and you can use the logical oper operators like not and 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 or not equal and so forth with it. It offers um, an integer data type um, and gives you both an signed integer data type as well as an unsigned integer data type. Um, and you can declare the size of that integer in increments of eight bits all the way up to 256 bits. Um, and if you don't put a size after it, uh, it'll just default to 256 bits. And you might ask, uh, why would you want to declare an 8-bit size versus 256-bit size? Why not just always use 256 bits? Like in Java, we always just use the basic integer or the basic double for a floating point number. Well, remember that when we're dealing with Solidity, we're talking about writing smart contracts. And everything we do on the blockchain is going to have a cost in gas, which is a cost in ETH. So you're spending money um whenever you do something on the blockchain and in particular one of the most expensive things to do from a gas perspective is storing information whether you're storing it in a variable or however you're storing it and so um, you can save a lot of money by using an 8-bit integer instead of a 256-bit integer if you only need an 8-bit in integer so you know money is driving you know, the programmer's choice and what they decide to do. Uh, fixed point numbers, you know, floating point numbers uh, are available. Um, you can specify the number of decimals after the point. Um, you can specify, there's a data type that actually represents an Ethereum address. And it's got various functions associated with it, like getting the balance on that particular address and transfer a transfer function to transfer ETH to that particular address. Um, there's a byte array that you can use to store arrays of bytes. Uh, there's an enumeration that you can use to enumerate your own discrete values. Uh, you can create arrays either of fixed size or dynamic size. Keep in mind the benefit to doing a fixed sized array is you know exactly how big it's going to be so you can predict the gas cost. If you do a, a dynamic array, you could run out of gas depending on your function. Uh, structs also exist. You know, you can create a user defined data container to group variables in it uh, as a struct. Um, also, another very useful data type is the mapping, where you can create a hash lookup table for key value pairs. Um, and in fact, I do tend to see a lot of people using mappings in um, smart contracts, just because, you know, again, this is cryptocurrency, people are pretty useful, interested in hash tables, and so it just makes sense to go ahead and use a mapping. All right, so that's a look at the Solidity data types. Now let's talk about um, how the transaction message call context works. So, for example, here's a predefined uh, global variable um, in our transaction message call context. Um, you know, the message object is a transaction call or the message call that launched the contract execution it contains a number of useful uh, attributes, message sender, um, you know, represents the address that initiated the contract call, not necessarily the originating externally owned address the wallet that sent the transaction if our contract was called directly by an externally owned address at transaction then this is the address that signed the transaction 
but otherwise it would be a contract address if a, you know, if a contract directly called this contract. Uh, message value, the value of ether sent with this call. And uh, many of the times when we have the value of ether, it's actually gonna be denominated in way, which is the smallest amount of ETH. Uh, message gas, which is the amount of gas left in the gas supply for the execution environment for this transaction. Um, and that was later replaced by the gas left function. Uh, message data, which is the data payload of this call into our contract. And message sig, which is the first four bytes of the data payload uh, which is our function selector for the message signature. Now, whenever a contract calls another contract, the value of all the attributes, uh, these, these values may change to reflect the new caller's information. The only exception to that would be the delegate function call, which runs the code of another contract within the original message context. All right, um, here's a couple of transaction contexts. These uh, the transaction objects provides a means of accessing some transaction related information like transaction gas price, which is the gas price in the calling transaction and transaction origin, which is the address of the originating and externally owned address for this transaction. And sometimes that can be an unsafe. Uh, so don't rely on that. Uh, the block context, the block object contains information describing the current block. Uh, block hash uh, or uh, block number is the uh, block hash of the specified block number up to 256 blocks in the past. Um, and that was later replaced with the block hash function. Uh, block Coinbase is the address of the recipient of the current blocks fees and block reward. Block difficulty is the difficulty or proof of work of the current block. Block gas limit is the maximum amount of gas can be spent across all transactions, including the current block. Block number is the current block number by blockchain height. And the block timestamp is placed in the current block by the miner. So again, just like in Bitcoin, you can't really rely on the block timestamp, but it gives you an approximate time. Um, the address object is another object. Again, this one is describing an Ethereum address. So any address, either passed as an input or cast from a contract has a number of attributes and methods. Um, it's got a balance, which is the amount of ETH in that address, uh, denominated in way again is the smallest number of ETH. Uh, for example, the current contract, to access the current contract balance, you would type the words address parentheses this dot balance, kind of similar to what you would do in Java or other languages that use the this keyword. Um, address dot transfer amount, Transfer, transfers the amount and way to this address, throwing an exception if there's an error. Um, I use this ex, uh, function in an earlier lecture, showing an example as a method to, uh, as message sender transfer to transfer ETH to an, a particular address in our faucet example. Um, Address.send amount, similar to transfer, only instead of throwing an exception, if there's an error, it will return false. Um, and so you should always check the return value of the send to see if it returned false, because then that would indicate there was an error. Um, Address.call payload uh, is a low level call function that can construct an arbitrary message call for data payload it returns false on error. Uh, we don't recommend using this because it could potentially use all your gas, causing your contract to fail. Uh, address delegate call with a payload, again, has the same problem. It's a low level delegate call function. Uh, but has the full message context seen by the current contract. And again, things can go wrong with this. So we don't recommend using that one either. There's a number of other built-in functions uh, worth mentioning. Some of the more interesting ones include add mod and mol mod for module addition and multiplication. Um, we've got the hash uh, calculator functions like Kesek 256, SHA-286, SHA-3, and RIPE-MD-160 to calculate hashes with various standard hash algorithms. Uh, EC recovery to recover the address used to sign a message from the digital signature. Uh, Self-destruct uh, with a recipient address argument will delete the current contract, send in any remaining ether in the account to the recipient address. Um, and this uh, is referring to the address of the currently executing contract account. So Solidity's principal data type is a contract. 
you know, just like Java's principal data type is a class. Um, so our faucet example I used in a previous lecture simply defines a contract object, similar to any object in an object-oriented language. The contract is a container that includes data and methods. Solidity offers two other object types that are somewhat similar to an object, to, I'm sorry, to a contract, that is an interface and a library. The interface definition is structured exactly like a contract, except none of the functions are defined, they're only declared. So this is similar to interfaces in Java or C++. Uh, this type of declaration is often referred to as a stub. It tells you the function's argument and return types without implementing the function. An interface specifies the shape of a contract, and when inherited, each of the functions declared by the interface must be defined by the child that inherits that interface. The library contract is one that is meant to be deployed only once and then used by other contracts using the delegate call method. And this is kind of similar to a package or a library and other uh, programming languages. Within a contract, we define functions that can be called by an externally owned address transaction, you know, a transaction from a wallet or a transaction from another contract. So in our faucet example, we have two functions, a withdrawal function and an unnamed fallback function. Uh, so the syntax used to declare a function of solidity is shown here on the slide. It says function, and then you would define the function name, like, you know, we put like faucet right there. Then you'd have your list of parameters, like we're you know, requesting some ETH, we might put that there. Uh, then you would have your uh, modifiers, like public, private, internal, and external for your access modifiers. Then you'd have some additional modifiers for pure view and payable. Uh, then you'd have some other modifiers, and then you have your returns and the return types. So let's look at each of those in a slightly more detail. So the function name is the name of the function, which is used to call the function in a transaction from an externally owned address account uh, or from another contract or even from within the same contract. One function in each contract may be defined as a fallback function using the fallback keyword or a receive ether function defined using the receive keyword. If present, the receive ether function is called whenever the call date is empty, whether or not ether is received. Otherwise, the fallback function is called when no other function is named. The fallback function can't have any arguments or return anything. From a parameters perspective, following the function name, we specify the arguments that should be passed to the function with their names and types. In our faucet example we took a look at earlier, we defined an unsigned integer called withdrawal amount, which was going to specify the amount of ETH to withdraw. And that was the only uh, argument in our withdrawal function. Um, the next set of keywords are the visibility keywords uh, for specifying the function visibility. Uh, public, external, internal, and private. Public is the default. Such functions can be called by other contracts or by externally owned address account transactions or from within the contract. In our faucet example, both functions are defined as public. External functions are like public functions, except they can't be called from within the contract unless explicitly pre prefixed with the keyword this. So, for example, if I wanted to call withdrawal from within an external, uh, you know, from, you know, and ex and withdrawal was marked as external and I was still within the contract, I would have to say this dot withdrawal. Uh, I couldn't just say withdrawal to call that function within the contract. Internal functions, in contrast, are the opposite external. They're only accessible from within the contract. They can't be called by another contract or be called by an externally owned uh, account transaction. However, they can be called by derived contracts, you know, contracts that inherit from this contract. And then private functions are like internal functions, but they can't be called by derived contracts. They can only be called inside the current class contract. Keep in mind that the terms internal and private can be somewhat misleading. Any function or data inside a contract is always visible on the public blockchain, meaning anyone can see the code or the data. The keyword simply being who can call that function and when can they call that function. So the next set of keywords, pure, constant, view, and payable, are all about affecting the behavior of the function. 
So constant or view. Um, a function marked as view promises not to modify any state. The term constant is an alias for view, um, but basically it doesn't really do much and eventually it'll probably go away. Pure is a pure function is one that neither reads nor writes any variables in storage. It can only operate in arguments and return data without reference to any stored data. Pure functions are intended to encourage declarative style programming without side effects or state. A payable function is one that it can accept incoming payments. Functions not declared as payable will reject incoming payments. Uh, there are several exceptions uh, due to design decisions in, in the EVM. Coinbase payments uh, don't require a payable. And self-destruct inheritance refunds will be paid even if the fallback function is not declared as payable. But that makes sense because it's not really a code uh, execution in aspect of those types of payments anyways. So for example, in our faucet contract, we had the one payable function, which was a fallback function that we used to send ether to our contract, uh, our faucet contract. All right, next up is the contract constructor and also the self-destruct function. So there's a special function that is only used once. When a contract is created, it will run the constructor function if one exists to initialize the state of the transaction. Uh, the constructor is run in the same transaction as a contract creation. Uh, constructor function is optional. Uh, you don't have to have one in it. Constructors can be specified in two ways. Uh, in older versions of Solidity, uh, they actually use the constructor function use the same name as the contract name. However, that pro there's problems with doing that. The first problem with doing that is it makes a code a little harder to read and it makes it a little harder to debug in case there's a typo, then uh, the constructor doesn't match the, the contract and it's not actually a constructor. Um, and so in order to make smart contracts easier to debug and to avoid certain bugs, um, they changed constructors. So now we just use the keyword you see here, constructor, open shut parentheses, and then we have the code inside the constructor. In this case, the code we have inside the constructor is just owner equals message sender. Um, and so, so to summarize, a, a contract's life cycle will start with a creation transaction from an externally owned account or from a contract account. If there's a constructor, it's gonna be executed as part of contract creation to initialize the state of the contract as it's being created. Uh, and then that's it. The other end of the contract's life cycle is contract destruction. Contracts can be destroyed by a special Ethereum virtual machine opcode called self-destruct. It used to be called suicide, but the name was changed to avoid negative associations with the word suicide. So in Solidity, this operation code is exposed as a high-level built-in function called self-destruct, um, which takes one argument, the address, to receive any Ether balance remaining in the contract. And so a call to self-destruct looks like self-destruct, parentheses, address, and then, you know, whatever address you want to send it to. Uh, note that you must explicitly add this command to your contract if you want the contract to be deletable. This uh, self-destruct command is the only way a contract can be deleted, and it is not present in your contract by default. In this way, uses of a contract who might rely on a contract being there forever can be certain that a contract can't be deleted if it doesn't contain a self-destruct operation code. So here's our example of the destructor. We've got this function destroy, it's available publicly. Uh, only the owner can actually call it, anyone else will get an error. And then the owner can self, then it can be self-destructed and the owner receives any ETH that's left over. Um, and so for example, uh, this is showing us how we could add this destructor and this constructor to our example faucet that we had shown previously. All right, so let's talk about function modifiers.
So Lee offers a special type of function called a function modifier. You apply modifiers to functions by adding the modifier name in the function declaration. Modifiers are often used to create conditions that apply to many functions within a contract. Um, so for here, for example, uh, let's create a function modifier that expresses uh, access that only uh, the, the owner can uh, call this function. So if we look at our destructor function here, we've got, this is what we showed in the previous page. We had function destroy publicly available, but then you have this require statement that says that this must be true or you throw an error message. So we require that the message sender is the owner. Okay, so whoever calls this function has to be the owner of the contract. And if they are, then uh, we'll get past this require statement and now we call self-destruct, we terminate the contract and the owner gets remaining ETH as a refund. All right, let's suppose that uh, we want to create, we want to do this for many, many functions, not just one function, but we want to require a message sender. Well, so if we're going to do it for several functions, why don't we create a modifier? So we're going to create this modifier we call only owner, and it basically adds this line of code require message sender equals owner to any function that has this modifier listed after the uh, name of the function. So our, mo our modified version of destructor can be written as function destroy, similar to what we had up there, public the same. Now we put this only owner here, right here, and I no longer have to say require message sender equals owner. That's just gonna be pasted in by having only owner. And so my, my function can be just self-destruct owner. So typically you would create modifiers like this only when you're gonna be doing something multiple times and you don't wanna keep retyping it every time. Um, the other advantage of doing it only once is that way if you do it perfectly and you don't have any errors, well, then you know you don't have any errors every time it gets copied in. Um, however, using modifiers is somewhat more difficult uh, from a debugging and readability perspective, uh, but it is more, it does provide some efficiency gains. All right. So these function modifiers are really useful. Uh, they're good for preconditions, um, but they, they they don't make uh, the code. They make the code a little harder to read, though, because now all of a sudden, uh, you know, you get whenever you see only owner, you got to go look it up and see what it actually the code is. All right, so let's talk about something else: contract inheritance. So Lily's contract object supports inheritance which is a mechanism for extending a base contract with additional functionality. Uh, to use inheritance, well, basically we use the keyword is. So for example, we've got contract child is parent. This is how, and so child is gonna inherit from the parent contract. So what that means then is with inheritance is that the child contract inherits all the methods, functions, and variables that the parent contract has. Um, Solidity also supports multiple inheritance, which can be specified by commas after the uh, after the contract names. So we, here we've got contract child is parent one, comma parent two. So the child's going to inherit all the functions, methods, and variables of both parent one and parent two. So inheritance has a lot of advantages. Um, you know, it allows you to write your contracts in a way to achieve modularity, extensibility, and reuse. Uh, you know, you can keep your contracts relatively simple and add, and then have, you know, child contracts add additional capabilities and more specialized. Um, let's talk about error handling. When a contract call terminates with an error, all the state changes are reverted all the way up the chain of contract calls if more than one contract was called. Um, the assert and require functions operate in pretty much the same way, evaluating a condition and stopping execution of an error if the condition is false. Um, and so basically, our transactions are going to be atomic, meaning they're either going to complete successfully or they're going to have no effect on the state and are reverted entirely. Uh, 
Now, the way assert works is, you know, asserts generally used when the outcome is expected to be true, requiring that we use assert to test internal conditions. By comparison, require is usually used when testing inputs, uh, setting our expectations for those conditions. Um, so, for example, um, using require with message sender equals owner. So in that case, uh, with require message sender equals owner, the require function is basically acting as a gate condition, preventing execution of the rest of the function and producing an error if it's not satisfied. Um, and you can also even include a text message explaining why it wasn't satisfied. Um, there are revert and throw functions that halt the execution of a contract and revert state changes. Um, Certain conditions in a contract can generate errors regardless of whether you check for them. Um, but it's probably good to always check explicitly or provide a clear error message on failure. Now, additional error checking code can increase gas consumption slightly, but it offers better error reporting than if you don't have the error handling code in there. And that error reporting code might be pretty useful to avoid uh, repeated failures. Let's talk about events, which are closely related to errors. Uh, when a transaction completes successfully or not, it's going to produce uh, a transaction receipt. Transaction receipt contains log entries that provide information about the actions that occurred during the execution of the transaction. Events are the solidity objects that are used to construct these logs. Events are especially useful for light clients and decentralized app services, which can watch for specific events and report them to the user interface or make a change in the state of the application to reflect an event in an underlying contract. Event objects take arguments that are serialized and recorded in the transaction logs in the blockchain. You can supply the keyword index before an argument to make the value part of an index table that can be searched or filtered by an application. Um, here's an example of adding some events into our faucet example of smart contract. So we're gonna add in two events one to log any withdrawals and one to log any deposits. And so we'll call these uh, two events withdrawal and deposit. Um, so here is our definition up at this top block. We say contract faucet is mortal. We're inheriting from the mortal contract. And we got event withdrawal and event deposit. And each one takes a couple arguments for an address and an amount. Um, and in particular, we're using an indexed address uh, to make allow searching and filtering. Uh, now we're going to use the emit keyword to incorporate event data in the transaction logs. So we've got our function withdrawal and our function receive. Uh, and in the withdrawal function, we're going to emit a withdrawal event saying that uh, message sender withdrew this amount of money. In our receive, we're going to admit there was a deposit into the contract from message sender of this amount of money. So we've set up our contract to um, you know, emit these events when they happen, when someone deposits money or someone withdraws money. So how do we see the results of the transaction? Um, so you can create an application that would then look on the blockchain at the event log and check out the events. All right, let's talk about calling other contracts. Um, calling other contracts within your contract is very useful, but potentially risky. Um, so we're going to talk about several different ways to achieve this and evaluate different risks. Uh, in short, the risks arise from the fact that you may not know what that other contract is going to do. Um, so, you know, or you may not know who's calling into your contract and what they're trying to do. So when writing smart contracts, you should keep in mind that while you can mostly expect to be dealing with externally owned address is there's nothing to stop complicated and perhaps uh, malicious contracts from calling into your code. So, you know, 
contracts can create an instance of another contract. They can address an existing in instance. They can invoke all of its public functions. The safest way to call another contract is if you create that contract yourself. That way you are certain of its inter interfaces and behavior. To do this, you can simply instantiate the contract using the keyword new, as in other object oriented languages like Java. In Solidity, the keyword new will create the contract on the blockchain and return an object that you can use to reference it. Let's say you want to create and call a faucet contract, we'll find another contract called token. So here we've got our token contract token, which inherits from mortal. And then we've got to create a variable called faucet. And now in our constructor, we're going to take that variable called faucet and we'll assign uh, a new faucet contract to that variable. And now I can interact with this faucet variable and my other functions and do stuff with it. Uh, Now I've got an import statement up here because our uh, we're actually going to be importing a completely separate contract file, faucet.sol, um, to work with our token contract. And we could even, you know, if your constructor accepts different arguments, you could even have different arguments being passed in and so on. Here's an example. Uh, of specifying the value of ethers that are being transferred in. We've got faucet equals new faucet object, and we're even going to specify, hey, we're going to pass it in uh, 0.5 ethers to the value of that faucet object. And you can also invoke different functions of the contract being called. For, so for example, we created that contract uh, faucet, and now we're going to destroy it using the destroy uh, fun, uh, function that belonged to that contract to, at the end of the life cycle when we're done using it. Uh, in this particular case, uh, because contract token is creating the faucet, uh, it's considered the owner of this uh, faucet contract and it can destroy it. Another way you can call a contract is by casting the address of an existing instance of the contract. So here we're addressing an existing instance. Uh, with this method, you apply a known interface to an existing interface. Uh, it's therefore important you know for sure that the instance you're addressing is in fact the other data type you expect it to be. So here we've got, uh, again, token is mortal. We've got our faucet reference, and we are going to, uh, uh, pass in to our constructor an address of a contract. And assuming that address of the contract is of type faucet, we'll be okay when we do this. If it is not of, if that address is not of type faucet, you know, it's a different type of contract or it's an externally owned account, we will get an error here and this will fail. So this casting that we're doing is much riskier than the previous approach because we don't know for sure that this address F is actually of type faucet. Uh, so when we call withdraw, we're assuming it accepts the same arguments and executes the same code as our faucet, but we can't know for sure. Um, and furthermore, what if someone subclass faucet, then it would pass this test here, but again, their withdrawal, this is a subclass might be different than how withdrawal normally operates. So using addresses passed as input uh, and cast them in specific objects is more dangerous and risky than creating the contract yourself. Uh, so Lee offers some other approaches for calling other contracts, but I'm not gonna get into those during this lecture. Let's talk about gas. Uh, gas, is an incredibly important consideration in writing smart contracts. Gas is a resource which constrains the maximum amount of computation that Ethereum is going to allow a transaction to consume. If the gas limit is exceeded during the computations, several things can, will happen. First, an out of gas exception will be thrown. Then the state of the contract prior to execution will be reverted. And then all Ether used to pay for the gas will, is still going to be spent. The gas is not going to be refunded. So because gas is paid by the user who initiates the transaction, 
Users are discouraged from calling functions that have high gas costs. It's in the programmer's best interest to minimize the gas costs of a contract's functions. So there are certain practices that are recommended when constructing smart contracts so as to minimize the gas cost of a function call. Um, so what can we do? Well, first off, avoid dynamically sized arrays. I, you know, I mentioned earlier that arrays can be statically defined or they can be dynamically defined. Um, so why should we avoid dynamically sized arrays? Well, any loop through a dynamically sized array where a function performs operations in each element or searches for a particular element introduces a risk of using too much gas. Indeed, the contract might run out of gas before finding the desired result, or before acting on every element, thus wasting time and ether without giving any result at all. And the reason why you might run out of gas is you don't know how big the dynamically sized array is, and therefore it might take too long to get through it. Uh, you want to avoid calls to other contracts for similar reasons. Calling other contracts, especially when the gas cost of their functions is not known, introduces the risk of running out of gas. Avoid using libraries that are not well tested and broadly used. The less scrutiny a library is received from other programmers, the greater the risk of using it. Um, estimating gas costs. Uh, if you need to estimate the gas necessary to execute a certain method of a contract, considering its arguments, you could use um, the following procedure we show here. Uh, here we've got a, a, a variable for contract and a variable for gas estimate. Uh, you know, calling estimate gas. So estimate gas will give us an estimate, which may vary slightly vary based on execution path for different input parameters. Um, you know, it's an estimate based on the Turing completeness of the EVM. Um, however, it's relatively easy to create a function that will take vastly different amounts of gas to execute different calls, uh, resulting in huge hugely different gas costs from one call to the next. However, most functions will give you a similar estimate most of the time. Um, you, can, you can obtain the current gas price from the network by calling web3 eth get gas price. And from there, you can multiply your get gas price times your gas estimate and convert it to eth and that'll give you the actual cost. So thanks for uh, watching this uh, lecture on programming solidity in Ethereum. Tune in next time when we are going to dive into an alternative programming language for Ethereum, uh, which is Viper.